Hello, everyone. Thank you guys for coming tonight. I appreciate you taking time, and girls, out of your busy schedule to be here. Tonight, we're gonna, I'm going to introduce you to stock selection and the art of stock selection. It really is a bit of an art, and we'll get to that in just a few minutes. Um, obviously, thank you guys again for coming here. There's a disclaimer screen. I'm, I need to show this at the beginning of every um, webinar, obviously. Uh, I could sum it up for you. All predictions are about the future, and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. Whenever I talk or speak, whatever, my wife says, hey, Dave, what do you speak about? Not the Holy Grail, huh? And I cringe a little bit because I often talk about the Holy Grail. And it's really an overused term to a point where it, it actually aggravates me a little bit when I hear it and read about it. But I think there's no better term to describe this perfect market condition, this perfect system that just simply doesn't exist. Now, years ago, it was said that money management is the real holy grail. And money management is vitally important, but I'll take that one step further. I think your best defense is a good offense. I'll get emails from people, and there's one in particular I remember, and this individual probably thinks I'm picking on him, but I've actually had a couple that are like this where people will say, Dave, I got stopped out 19 or 20 times in a row, and they're about, uh, they're about ready to jump out the window. And they're doing one or two things wrong or a combination thereof. Their stops are either too tight, which is an easy fix, obviously. They're not adjusting their stop to the volatility of the market. And I often cover volatility in my weekly webinars. The other thing is their stock picking is not that good, and it's probably uh, that more than anything. And In fact, just recently someone... Uh, sent me five picks, and three or four out of the five picks I would have never have taken uh, for many of the reasons that we're going to talk about tonight. So th there is no holy grail, but if you learn how to pick stocks, and it is an art, and it does take time, and that's why it's going to take me, oh, I think six hours on Saturday at least, and then I've allocated another f uh, total of 14 hours, so another eight hours to properly cover stock selection and then there's going to be some homework and I think uh, for you guys and, and it's going to take a while for you to get a feel for it but it's very much a teachable uh, type of art. Now counterfeit currency detectives do not learn their trade by studying fakes and they study the genuine article and once they know what to look for the fakes become very obvious so this line of reasoning also applies to life in general and success does not come about by studying failure. You want to be successful, then you should study success. So I've cherry-picked a few charts to look at. Okay, this is one that set up recently, uh, earlier this year at least, and it had a few things going for it. So let's take a look at a few charts first, and then I'll, I'll get into um, how to find these stocks in the selection process. You can see this stock kind of worked its way higher in here, kind of on a gradual basis, we really didn't have any setup whatsoever back then, but then look what happened in February, it began to accelerate higher, and then we had a nice little trend knockout move, this knocks out the weak hands, and helps to clear the way for the stock to trade higher, and this is what happens afterwards, this is a little setup way back here, okay, didn't do a whole lot at first, but it didn't do anything wrong, and what you do is you stay with the position when that happens, and then you use a trailing stop to stick with it. And this one eventually stopped out somewhere in here for about 150% type of move. Now here's another one, and we're going to talk more about transitional patterns in just one second. This stock made an all-time low here and made another low here. So you've got this major double bottom working. And then, more importantly, notice how persistent this move was off its lows. And then notice how it begins to accelerate higher. So in your first pullback, and in this particular case, it also made a bow tie after these all-time lows in here. So you know that this stock, especially after this nice big base in here at low levels, has the potential to trade higher. Furthermore, this stock was way up here years ago. I think it was at, uh, don't quote me on this, but I think it was at 140 or whatever. We can back the chart out in a minute if we have time. And this is the move that came from that. You can see this bow tie way back here. It's, so, it's amazing to look at how tiny this little move was. But that was a setup we were just looking at. 
And then with the trailing stop, this one did require a little bit of discretion, as I talked about quite a bit in the weekend charts. It did come down here and sort of nick that stop. But if you could have applied a little discretion, even here, it's not a bad trade, okay? From there to there, it's pretty much a double. But if you could have held on through that bit of a nick, so far, it's run up about 500% or so. Now, here's an IPO, and I'm going to show you a couple things with IPOs in a few minutes. Uh, but notice that this stock worked its way higher, and then it began to accelerate higher, pulls back a little bit, triggers. Again, it didn't do a whole lot right away, but then it began to work its way higher. We got an initial profit target somewhere in here, and then it began to meander. Then it took off again, and then we're, there was a secondary setup in here. There was a discretionary call. Again, another stop, Nick, right in here. But as you can see, it took off nicely and then eventually stopped out. Now, here's another example. This one's a little bit older, but this is a very volatile, uh, one of those rare earth stocks that can be very volatile. But what's cool about this stock is just notice that it just kind of bumps along in here and slowly works its way higher. And then it begins to accelerate higher nice and cleanly, and then it pulls back. A bit of a TKO type of move here. So you get a trigger here, nice rally up. And if I'm trying to think if this is the one, I remember we had a TKO a year or two ago where we got knocked out, and by the end of the day, we were looking to get back in on the following day at least. We were look, we had to set up on the following day. But notice that it pulls back again and begins to set up. And that's another thing that I'm going to talk about a lot on Saturday is you want to look for these stocks that have this thrust, pullback, thrust, pullback, thrust, pullback, rinse, and repeat type of pattern. Now, one thing that's very important to understand now that we looked at a few charts one thing that's very important to understand is you need to understand efficiency and more importantly inefficiency when it comes to stocks now what is that well efficient market hypothesis states that everything is priced into a market so you're foolish to think that you could beat the market and to some extent they're right when it comes to very efficient stocks now a very efficient stock is going to be a big cap stock, a well-known stock, uh, maybe like a McDonald's or Burger King or even like an IBM. Not that these stocks can't make big moves, but in general, everything tends to be priced in to the stock. So the theory comes apart with less efficient stock. It could be a solar stock with a promise of serving, solving the world's energy crisis. I just showed you one that went up 500% or so. Another one went up a couple hundred percent. And it doubles over a few days or a few weeks or even a few months. It could be a biotech with a promise of curing some hard disease. And these markets aren't efficient. These large potential moves are not priced into them. And it doesn't necessarily have to be some new technological revelation that's going to solve the world's problem. It could be burritos, movie delivery, or even comfortable exercise clothes for guys like me who eat too many burritos. Okay, So these smaller yet-to-be-discovered companies or more efficient, so if inefficient, I should say. Okay. Now, why is inefficiency so important? Well, going back to the sun power, you can see that this stock made a 760% plus move in less than a year. So that's why it's important to identify these inefficient stocks and look for a place to get on board. All you need is a couple of these in your portfolio each year, and you're going to do just fine. In fact, one of the homework assignments I'm going to give um, you on Saturday is I'm going to show you how to find these big winners, prior winners, and then go back and see if there was something there that could have gotten you in to that position. Obviously, in this one, there was a bow tie off of those all-time lows. It was a first thrust type of pattern, there was some persistency, there was some acceleration, and all those, these other things that we have covered so far tonight. But that's a great exercise. Again, getting back to the studying success, it's a fantastic exercise of going in and studying success. Now, this is just one thing uh, about efficiency. I have four or five more different slides on this that I'm going to talk about in a lot more detail. But in general, when you look at that capitalization, the more efficient a stock, the bigger cap that stock's going to be. Now, that doesn't mean that, again, if inefficient stock, I'm sorry, efficient stocks can't move. I'm getting tripped up a little. Uh, Yahoo has made a decent move. 
just recently, but as we're going to see in a minute, a company like eBay just kind of chops around and meanders around. It doesn't really trend that much now that it's gotten so big. Okay. So again, in general, you want to be going after the smaller cap stocks within reason because they tend to be a little bit more inefficient, and those type of huge moves are possible. Not that they come along every day, but if you pick your spots carefully and you work hard at it, you will be able to find these stocks ahead of time. Now, let's talk about a few things you want to look for and a few things you want to avoid. Now, you heard me say persistency several times already tonight. And that is probably one of the best things in the world. I want to give you a few takeaways tonight. I know you've heard me, many of you probably heard me talk about persistency before, but if you haven't, persistency is very important. Mathematically, it's equivalent to linear regression. But you know me, or hopefully you, you know who I am. I'm not a huge fan of indicators. I think you could just draw lines in your chart and you'd be much better off. On the downside, it means the bars tend to go down day after day after day after day. And if you draw a line through the bars, again, mathematically, that's equivalent to linear regress regression. If you feel like you must play with some indicators, I would encourage you not to, but if you feel like you must, throw some linear regression lines on the chart, and you'll notice that through that least square fit, whatever it's called, uh, method, it's going to draw a trend line through the bars. Well, I would just much rather prefer drawing the line through the bars. Now, if you don't walk away with anything tonight, Look for persistency in markets. In fact, I have a pattern called persistent pullbacks. If all you did in your trading career was trade persistent pullbacks, meaning you look for a nice persistent uptrend, and then you look to trade a pullback off of that persistent up, uh, uptrend, provided it resumes the uptrend or provided it resumes a downtrend, you get an entry, of course. I think you would do fairly well, and I preach quite often if you – Go back to 2008, I couldn't find any long side setups in an entire year, and that was one of the worst bear markets in history. So let's just say you just came into trading and all you were trading were persistent pullbacks. Well, I've said this several times before, you would have beaten 96% of all money managers. Okay, You certainly would have beaten all the hedge funds, uh, not all the hedge funds, let me take that back. You certainly would have beaten all the mutual funds because they just simply followed the market down. Market was down 50% in the middle of the year. The average mutual fund was down 50%. Well, by the end of the year, market was only down, only I say, down 40%. Well, the average mutual fund was down 40%. So you wouldn't have gotten any, I mean zero setups, on the long side for that entire year. It would have kept you either out of the market if you're long only, or it would have kept you on the short side. Okay. Any suggestions for when everything looks like a setup? Should that be a red flag? Um, not necessarily. If you get a if in fact that could be a good sign. If everything looks like a setup, if everything's set up, I mean the best setups in the world are when the market looks like this and then the sectors look like this, and then almost every individual stock looks like that. You get all three things working for you, the market, the sector, and the individual stock, okay? That's, the, that's some of the best times in the world to trade. That doesn't happen often, okay? But when it does, it could be a great time. Now, let's talk a little bit more about persistency. And again, this stock trades very cleanly, okay? or at least it did back here. Even way back here, although there's no setup here, it just kind of goes sideways. When it goes up, it tends to go up day after day. Then it goes sideways a little bit. Notice it goes up day after day. Kind of goes a little sideways in here. Notice it's sort of building these little bases on top of bases. That's one thing we're going to talk a lot about on Saturday. We talk a lot about stair-stepping, as I mentioned earlier. Those are some things that you want to look for. And then notice this nice persistent up move. And on top of that persistent up move, notice that, and this is um, accelerating momentum strategy. If you need that pattern, I'll give it to you. It's in my second book. But notice that it worked its way higher, and then it begins to accelerate higher in here. You got a little pullback in here. That looked okay, but this one looked even better. It accelerates straight higher, and it has a nice little TKO move. In fact, I call that a, an arbalist. TKO. An arbalist is a kind of like a crossbow type of instrument. And it gets stretched. The reason I call it that is because it gets stretched really far back, and then it gets stretched the other way, and then it's like kind of like a one, two, three 
type of move. But the main thing I want to show you this chart is the fact that it's very persistent and the uptrend was accelerating in here and you had a nice little knockout move. Now, just as persistency and follow through is a good thing, the bad thing would be an electrocardiogram. If you're looking at a chart and you can hear beep, 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 beep in your head, then it's obviously a stock you don't want to trade. You would be amazed. You're probably like, Dave, why are you always talking about avoiding these electric cardiograms? Well, the reason is you would be absolutely amazed at the number of stocks I get asked for my opinion on that have no trend whatsoever. And eBay is a great current example of that. Look at this stock. It's up. It's down. It's up. It's down. It's a Jackie Mason. What's his name? Jackie Mason stock? It's up. It's down. It's up. It's down. It's all over the place. Okay. There's really no... There's really no trend there until, well, maybe recently it's kind of fallen off a little bit. But this is certainly not a stock that you want to be trading. So you should immediately throw that one out. Okay, we'll get to those questions. Keep the questions coming. And as they, as they fit to the slides, I'll cover them. And if they don't, um, I'll get to them um, as soon as we get done with the uh, presentation. Be happy to. Okay, uh, overhead supply is another bad thing, okay? Now, remember that technical analysis does not have to be that technical. At least my approach to technical analysis is it. I'm looking at the charts, and I'm trying to determine what people have done in the past and what they might be inclined to do in the future based on what they've done in the past. I was at a, a meeting, a professional meeting, um, a few months back in New Orleans, and Tom McClellan gave a little speech. And he said something very interesting that stuck with me. He says, when you buy a stock, you're forming a relationship with the company. And I guess he's referring to the fact that you're expected a company to do certain things and provide um, some sort of service or a product and run their business properly. So you're building that relationship with the company. But with what many people fail to realize, the people at least who don't understand charts and technical analysis, is that you're also building a relationship with anybody who has bought that company before you, who has bought that stock before you. And Tom went on to say, and those people will screw you. And that really, that really struck a chord with me, and it just, it just boils down technical analysis to its essence. Okay? So overhead supply is an area where people have bought a market. Okay? It is, oh, it is above where the current price is. So say you got a beautiful setup down here, but you've got some overhead supply that's not too far from where you are. So the distance back, how far back that overhead supply is, and then how far, it's kind of like a vertical thing and a horizontal. Vertically, how far is it above the market? Hey, if that overhead supply is up here, and I can make 100% on the trade before we run into trouble, then shoot, why not? I'll take the trade. We, uh, we got long a stock years ago, uh, XL, symbol ticker uh, XL, and we were looking for a swing trade but willing to stick around as long as the trend stays in our favor. As you know, I am take a hybrid approach because you can only trade the short term when it comes to markets, or only predict the short term, I should say, but you could stick around longer term. Well, that stock had overhead supply 120-something percent, I think, above where our entry was, so pfft, I wasn't worried about that. It's, it'll probably never get there. Well, it got there and had a little trouble getting through it, but eventually got through it. So that becomes a good problem to have. If I get in the stock and it's got overhead resistance 100% above where I get into the stock, yeah, so what? If I'm up 100%, I'm going to be a happy camper. So the vertical distance is very important, and the horizontal distance is also important, and the width of the overhead supply. Because the width of the overhead supply, which I have marked as A here, is vitally important because there's going to be more and more people that get comfortable in this range or have bought in that range. And then when the market begins to drop out of that range, they become a, an unhappy camper. Uh, a story I often tell, my neighbor calls me up. It was GE, and it was, um, I think it was like at 18 or something. And then they had all this overhead resistance, and it was like a 21 here. And he wanted to buy GE. And I said, Steve, here's the problem. If you buy this stock, 
it's only gonna you only have about maybe a two point run into it, maybe three, and it's gonna hit all this overhead supply around twenty one. I said it looks like there was a lot of trading around twenty one to twenty three or whatever the case may be. And then he says, Well, oh, well I bought it at twenty three. So he was actually looking to average into a bad position. So that tells me right there, that's proof positive that overhead supply is important and that there are people that are looking to get out of break even at that overhead supply. So that's a bad thing. Now, this stock set up a while back. I did not take this setup. I did not recommend this setup, but I did show it in my Landry list in my trading service for the next day. Some of my peeps took it. And the reason they took it was I said I said, guys, got a little bit of overhead supply here, back here. Not a tremendous amount, but enough to keep an eye on. And then lo and behold, what did this stock do? The stock rallied up, kind of bumped up against it. I think it eventually might have broke through it, but it did hit some initial resistance right at that overhead supply. I like to see clear air on a stock or have that overhead resistance like way up here. So if it rallied all the way up here to a double, then again, I'm a happy camper. So you have to make that go or no do go decision when you have overhead supply. I'm probably a little bit too much of a, of a perfectionist when it comes to stock selection, but I think you should be too, at least until you become very successful as a stock picker and a trader, and you could actually go into position and say, you know what, Dave, or self, you know what, self, I think this position looks pretty darn good. I think it's worth that 20, 30% move up to that overhead supply, and then that becomes a good problem to have, okay? Uh, the question is, uh, on slide 23, do you also look at volume with overhead supply? No, I do not, and that's a good question. Now, um, I don't use volume at all in my trading, and that's uh, it's, it's kind of a long, there's a long-winded answer for that, um, but let's, the short answer is that there's too many derivative products out there to make uh, volume viable. Maybe years ago volume could have worked, but now there's derivative products and derivatives of derivatives and flash trading and all these other crazy things that are happening in the market that makes volume even more irrelevant. Now, with that said, I will occasionally, okay, I don't actually factor it into my trading, but I have experimented with a little bit of volume by price analysis, and that's kind of similar to, um, what do you call that, market profile. And, and I saw Linda, Linda Rasky speak once, and she was talking about that. Uh, so I do have some charts that I occasionally look at with volume by price. I haven't incorporated that directly into my trading, but one thing that I have noticed is volume by price might look like this, something like this, and then it'll look like this. And you'll notice that the pyramid often stacks up right around where the overhead supply is. So... It's kind of like an indicator. I don't like an indicator as an indicator in and of itself, but I like an indicator as an illustrator to show me something. For instance, maybe if I get that bow tie, which is a moving average pattern of mine, suggesting a market has bottom like that solar stock, then maybe that's a stock that I might want to consider. But when I peel away that indicator, I look at the actual price, and it's like, aha, the price has moved. So by the same token, I'm not – going to rush out and incorporate volume by price into my analysis, but I do find it interesting that quite often the volume by price will, you have a big old bar like this, volume by price, and what's going to be around that? Usually you're going to have a huge amount of overhead supply right at that number, or let's say you got a huge base down here, you'll have a big volume by price down at a low level, okay? So it does help to point out support and resistance and things like that, okay? What's the difference between a setup and a breakdown? Okay, well, I'm not a breakout trader. A uh, breakout trader would, would look to buy like if it broke out of this range. A setup for me is going to be pullback in nature. Okay, I'm looking for a reversion to the mean move, okay, in the direction of the major trend. So if the trend's doing this, when that stock gets a little oversold in here, I'm looking to capture a reversion to the mean move back in the direction of the trend. Derek, if you want, uh, shoot me an email, or uh, it'd be easier just to go to my website, and uh, I'll show you some articles uh, to read on that, okay? Okay. Now, one thing I want to do tonight is I want to throw out some, a couple of gems to you. 
to where if all you did type of gyms, earlier I said if all you did was trade persistent pullbacks, you could walk away with that. And if you're not already successful, I think you could do that and you could be successful. And I think that you wouldn't get a whole lot of trades in choppy markets and you'd have to sit on your hands a lot and you'd have to learn how to be very patient. But I think you would become successful if all you traded was persistent pullbacks. Okay. Now, here's another gem for you. I think if all you did was trade IPOs, initial pub public offerings, I think you would do really well. Now, before I show you how to trade IPOs, let's talk about IPOs. IPOs are the promise of the future. Somebody brings a company public because they need some cash, and they're going to take that cash and do wonderful things with it. They're going to make some yoga clothes. They're going to make some really good burritos. They're going to do something that's a fad. They're going to solve the world's energy problems like those little solar stocks, especially that um, SCTY earlier. They're going to do something with that, that money they get. Now, here's the beauty of this. There's no pesky fundamentals, and that's one of the things, and I don't want to give away too much because I'll get in trouble, but if <laughs> that's one of the things I'm going to talk about on Saturday is when it comes to gauging inefficiency, you don't want any quantified. You want little or no quantifiable fundamentals, okay? I don't use fundamentals, but the less that exists, the better off you are. Let's take a look at like a McDonald's or something. You could, you could say, okay, what's the price of beef? How much, what's the price of wheat? Or what's the price of the, the buns? What's the minimum wage? You could factor all these things in. Not that you want to go through that painstaking trouble doing that, but some people out there do that to figure out where McDonald's should trade. And it probably trades somewhere about where it trades. Obviously, some competition can come in and they can maybe introduce a new sandwich or something. But for the most part, it's not going to make these big type of inefficient moves, okay, because it has quantifiable fundamentals. Well, a company coming public really doesn't have any quantifiable fundamentals. It's the promise of the future, and that's the beauty of it. They trade purely on emotions, okay. Now, here's the thing. People with vested interests are wanting the IPO to succeed. Did I say manipulation? No, of course not. Okay? But there are people who get allocated the IPO, and they're going to – I've got to stop short of saying anything, uh, anything that might uh, <laughs> ruffle some feathers here. But let's just say that there are a lot of people out there who want to see it succeed, okay? There's no bad memories. Now, let's go back a couple slides since we have a little time in here. Let's talk about bad memories again, okay? We just talked about overhead supply. Well, another way of describing overhead supply would be bad memories, okay? So whoever bought in this range and is now down here, again, what do we say? They're going to be an unhappy camper. Now, here comes the question. People always say, Dave, how far back does the overhead supply have to be? How wide does it have to be? And there's all these questions where it becomes a little bit of an art more than a science. Well, guess what? With an IPO, you don't have all those bad memories, okay? So, again, they trade purely on emotions, and that's a chart reader's dream. Remember and never forget that through technical analysis, through the reading of the charts, okay, through this art that we have learned how to read charts, we're reading the emotions of the others. And IPOs trade purely on emotions, which makes them a chart reader's dream. Now, on Saturday, I'm going to show you a couple of ancillary setups that are a little bit outside of my core methodology. But for the most part, if all you did was trade pullbacks and IPOs, okay, bona fide pullbacks, this stock ran from like 10 to 16, that's a 60% move or thereabouts, and then it pulls back, okay. That's that solar city we talked about earlier that had a really good run, okay. And here's the setup back here. Notice that it accelerated higher, and then you had a nice little pullback. No bad memories back here, remember. It didn't go straight up. It took a little while to get going, 
But if memory serves, I think we hit a profit target around here. We had that stop bumped up. And then we got another setup back here when it began to, I'm sorry, not here. We got another setup back here. Um, somebody asked me about breakouts earlier. If, if I was just seeing the stock, I would get in here. I wouldn't buy the breakout. Breakouts more often than not fail. But I will throw out another little gem to you. If you are going to trade breakouts, where should you trade breakouts? Trade them in IPOs, okay? But for the most part, look for those first IPOs. I'm sorry, look for those first pullbacks in the IPOs. Now, any questions on anything we talked about so far before I talk a little bit about trend and major transitions in trend? Okay, let's move on. Okay, now you guys have probably seen me give an introductory speech on trend before, so I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time talking about trend. I will go over it again in, um, on Saturday. There are some things you need to look for in trend. It's what I call trend qualifiers. You want to look for gaps or laps, L-A-P-S, and or laps in the direction of the trend. You want to look for wide range bars. You want to look for strong closes. And then you want to pay attention to your moving average, just, and you want to make sure they have slope, positive slope, and that you have daylight, meaning that the lows are greater than the moving average in uptrend and the highs are less than the moving average in downtrend. That simple technique of the daylight, of watching for the daylight, can really help to keep you on the right side of the market. Now, one thing I wanted to mention tonight, this is very very, 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 very simple. This is technical analysis 101. What has the stock or whatever market you're looking at done on a net, net basis? Okay. The price goes from here to here. Is it higher? Is it unchanged or is it lower? So what has it done? You'd be surprised how many, and this is something we're going to cover a lot on Saturday, but how many times I'll see somebody will ask me about a stock and they'll you know, pull back and they think it looks great, but if you look back about three months, the stock really hasn't made much forward progress. So whenever you're analyzing a market, never forget about this very, very, very simple technique of just looking at the net, net changed. Is it higher than it was a week ago, two weeks ago, three weeks ago, three months ago? Is it unchanged or is it lower? Okay, very simple concept, but very very important concept. And then of course, this is the back of my actual business card. This is my phone number. Don't call me right now because I'm in a webinar. But if you watch the recording of this, obviously you can. Um, I answer my own phone. This is my email. If you need to get in touch with me, uh, this uh, by the way was was done. Uh, this is what happens when you get a graphic artist on the cheap. The bull is not having its way with the bear, uh, although I've, I've grown to like the, the graphic and I've left it uh, after it was pointed out to me. Uh, all right, back of my card, very important. Uh, send me a self-addressed stamped envelope, P.O. Box 298, A-B-I-T-A -A Springs, Louisiana. 70420. That's my mailing address for my business. And it's called Cynthia Trading. Right here, Cynthia Trading, LLC. Uh, send me a self addressed stamped envelope, and I'll throw you a business card in there. And this has my uh, patented trend following, following uh, on the follower on the back. If you ever get lost in the market, you hold this, the back of my card, up to your screen and say, hey, is it an uptrend, a downtrend, or a sideways trend? Now, I joke a lot about that. But again, you would be surprised how many emails I field on electrocardiogram looking stocks that are just absolutely sideways in here. So, but I am going to spend some time, obviously, talking about those aforementioned trend qualifiers to help qualify the trend. Now, here's your takeaway for tonight. The main thing you want to look for is persistency. If all you did, again, was trade those persistent markets, you would do fine. Another thing I want to talk about is catching trends early. Now, we'll come back to this little solar stock once again because it's just the example of the year, literally. And 
if all you did was trade these bow ties, you could email me if you need bow ties, the pattern. I'll give it to you. Um, on Saturday, we're going to focus on finding the best stocks to begin with. We're not going to focus as much on the patterns, although the pattern, uh, I'm sorry, the setups, although the setups are going to come up. I'm assuming that everybody has a general knowledge of the setups. Um, if not, and you are, you do want to come on Saturday, let me know, and I'll give you um, I'll give you some material so you can get up to speed on the setups. Um, anyway, if all you did was trade bow ties and first thrust, okay, these transitional patterns off of all time highs or off of all time lows, I think you would be very successful. You would spend a lot of time again waiting. But whenever I see some of these transitional patterns off of these all-time lows, or at least, let's say, multi-year lows, or ideally like decade lows, I know that that market has the potential to explode higher. The reason is because the most amount of people are going to be trapped on the wrong side of the market when that market begins to turn. I'm not saying bottom fish because... You don't know at this juncture here if this market's going to keep on going. Now, what probably happened is some extra people probably bailed out because they're like, oh, no, here we go again. And then all of a sudden the market begins to take off without them. But, again, if all you did was trade those bow ties off of all-time highs, all-time lows, or other transitional patterns such as first thrust, I think you would be very successful. And if you go back, uh, go back if you have time. Even in efficient markets like bonds, uh, it's funny, people are talking about bonds being at low levels now. The bonds act actually topped out a couple of years ago. Apply your bow ties, you'll see a, a, there was a bow tie in the bonds. There were weekly bow ties off of all-time highs in the P's in both 2000 and in 2007, and in the corresponding bottoms in 2000 and was it 2003? I forget, I'll have to pull the chart. And then the other bottom was in 2009. So you're going to be able to catch those major trends if you wait for that major high and major low and then wait for that transitional pattern to occur. Okay. Now, the other thing I'm going to talk about is treasure hunting. And it is a lot of work if you're going to trade like I trade. But for me, I just I really enjoy it. I, I just have a big cup of coffee. I always joke at a service because I do this recording every night. A lot of times I'm like, you know, <laughs> and I'm always joking. It's like, okay, Dave, one cup of coffee next time. But I just get a big old cup of coffee, and I just love to look at charts and lots of charts. And usually if I'm speaking to a, to a sizable crowd, I'll ask, if, are there any musicians? And, and by the law of averages, usually somebody will raise a hand. And I'll say, okay, how did you get, how did you become good at being a musician? And they always say, practice, okay? And that's the only way to get good, I think, at anything in life is to practice it. And, and, and more importantly, deliberate practice where you try to become a little bit better every day. Now, I could take the steepness out of your learning curve by showing you exactly what to look for, but you will have to still practice on your own. So first thing I do is I create a tradable universe. I like to see an average volume greater than 250,000. I think I have that set on a 30-day average. I might dip a little bit below that number, and that's where you're going to find some very good inefficiencies, but they're also going to be uh, lower in um, volume, so they're going to be a little thinner and less liquid to trade. If I've got 250 k or more, ideally a half a million or more, but not too big, I know that the stock has a potential to make a sizable uh, move, provided I have, of course, the setup. Uh, another thing I like to do is I maintain some momentum list, and one list I call it my Landry 100. And uh, this is actually this is actively managed, meaning that each day I take out some stinkers and I add in some uh, strong stocks to that list. And this has been a wonderful exercise for me, and I would encourage you to do it like you're running a little portfolio, or let's say you're running a mutual fund. Just pretend you're running a mutual fund and track these 100 stocks, and I'll show you how I do that on Saturday, uh, but I'd sort stocks by the 52-week high, and that tells me what stocks are making, obviously what stocks are making new highs, but what sectors those highs are in. So it gives me an idea what's strong out there. The next thing I like to do is I sort my tradable universe by the 50-day historical volatility, and I begin going through those, each and every one 
of those stocks in that tradable universe, at least until it gets way down the list, towards the bottom of the list, where the lower HV stocks are going to be a little bit more efficient type of stocks that don't move around a whole lot. But I like to look at all of those because that gives me a really good feel for what's going on internally. And as I've been saying lately, especially in my newsletter, I've been talking about, guys, I looked at all these charts yesterday, and it just seemed like the market was weak. And then I pull up the Russell 2000, or as I call it in the newsletter, the Rusty. And guess what? The Rusty was lower on the day. So it's very important to look at all these stocks to get a feel for what's really going on. Once I do that, I run some very loose parameter scans, and that's going to give me pullbacks. It's going to help me find these transitional patterns just in case I miss them in the first pass. And occasionally I will run more precise scans. But you've got to avoid the trap of avoiding these uh, more precise scans because let's say I run a bow tie scan. It looks for a three-day crossing. Ideally, a textbook bow tie should have, let's say, a three- or four-day crossing. Okay? If my scan is set to three-day, then I'm going to miss the four-day setups, which might be very viable setups. If my scan is set uh, to some other parameter, that I might miss those, those setups. That might just be a little bit outside of what the textbook should say. Okay, But certainly within, as one of my clients puts it, the author's intent. And that's, again, where the art comes in, and that's where studying and paying attention to a lot of charts every day will help you to find these setups as opposed to running scans. Scans are great to help see what you may have missed, but don't use them as a crutch in and of itself. Everybody wants to push a, push a button, get a peanut out, some sort of magical scans. I could probably make a lot of money if I said, I've got this perfect scan out here, send me $200, I'll send you the scan, it's going to help you find the most incredible stocks in the world, okay? And it's only going to spit out a couple of days so you don't have to look at a lot of charts. I could probably make a lot of money if I sold that, but I can't in good conscience do something like that because I know that the market does not always adhere to exact, and you're going to have to dig a little deeper to find stocks. But I do run these scans just in case I miss something, okay? And the next thing you want to do is you want to study the sectors. I look at all of the sectors, okay? I look at what's trending, and then I'm and then I'm asking myself what's not, what's set up, and what's sideways. And again, that's going to get you a pretty good feel for the overall market. Now, say you got a sector that looks like this, okay? It's pulled back in a nice trend that's poised to resume its uptrend. So what I'll do is I'll jump within that sector and see if there's some stock that I may have missed that might be worthwhile trading. Now, one thing that's kind of cool is Every now and then, it's a bit of an aberration. You'll get a sector that looks like this, and it just looks like a beautiful setup, and there's no stocks within it that are set up just yet. Some of them are making new highs. Some of them are kind of meandering. But for the most part, most stocks in that sector are trending, obviously, because they, the sector's pulled back. But there's no setups, even though the overall sector is set up. This doesn't happen very often. But what it does, even though I'm not a huge fan of ETFs, I'm going to talk about the fact that ETFs or less efficient than your uh, potential inefficient stocks, okay? But even though I'm not a huge fan of ETFs, there are cases where you might want to buy an ETF to gain exposure to that particular sector. And then when the stocks within the sector begin setting up, then you go in and go after those more inefficient stocks. And that's where the real money is going to be. And then finally, the last thing you do is you study the indices. So I have a top-down approach but I do it in a bottom-up fashion to where I look at all these stocks first to give me a pretty good feel for what's going on, to give me some setups that are viable for the next trading day. And then I studied sectors, and then I study the overall market via the in indices. Okay. Now, so what else do we talk about on Saturday? I'm going to talk about three more ways to determine inefficiency. I'm going to give you some homework to help you become a better detective in finding those stocks. I'm going to show you how to create the tradable universe. Even though I believe in studying success, I'm going to show you quite a few ways to cull out a lot of bad stocks to begin with. Now, you're still looking at the stocks, but you're going to cull them out. Okay, uh, Everything you need to know to pick the best stocks for tomorrow. I'm going to go through my entire database after I go cover all the theory. 
I'm going to, well, first we're going to look at some charts, then I'm going to go through the, in, through the theory of what I'm doing, and then we're going to go back through those charts again, and I'm going to show you what stocks that I'm picking for tomorrow, which ones I like the best, and why, and you're going to get to see the exact stock pick that I have, or picks for Monday. Now, in addition to that, I'm going to have eight one-hour follow-up sessions spread over the next several months so we can see this thing in action. And I'm going to show you how and what stocks I pick during those sessions, and then we'll follow up on those. So it, exactly how I pick stocks, I'm going to show you that. Again, the sector analysis, uh, creating a momentum list. I'm going to expand on IPOs. And even though I'm not a fan of scanning, I'm going to show you how to look at all IPOs very easily. Now, this is just with one charting package, but I would imagine that this uh, this should work in other charting packages too. And I'll, sh I'll give you some ideas on how to do that. Um, there are a few patterns with IPOs that are outside of what I call my core methodology. My core methodology is pullbacks, and I very rarely uh, venture too far from that core methodology. But in the IPOs, I do think there are some patterns that you could use that are slightly outside of my core methodology. Uh, I want to talk a lot about transitions and getting into new trends early. We talked about a few patterns earlier tonight, overhead supply uh, and persistency, things to look for, things not to look for. I have about at least five more of those to look for. And a few more details here. Um, I think I mentioned this in the last week in charts, but this is kind of a little morbid, but I was working on my first book, and, and someone told me, Dave, you need to teach like you're dying. You need to teach like you're dying and or write like you're dying and then that your so your children can take all of your knowledge. So when you die, it's not completely lost. So they can take your knowledge and move on with it. So here's how I'm approaching this this webinar. It's twenty something years of knowledge on how to pick the, the best stocks. And I've been working on this for about a year now and I think I've got some pretty good information. You can see uh, quite a few slides, and then obviously we're going to hop into all these charts. It's all day on Saturday, December 14th, and then again, there's going to be eight one-hour sessions. Now, if you uh, sign up for the webinar, you're going to get a free uh, year of my trading service. In the trading service, I had somebody sign up a couple days ago. This is one year of uh, the service is uh, 1460. Now, if you need some more details, let me pull up my website for you. And while I do that, if you have any questions, um, Trading in general and stock selection or whatever, I'll be happy to cover that. We don't have to stick to uh, what's going to be covered and what's not. I'll be happy to answer anything that you have. So if you go to my website, I'll show you. It's right here. If you click on, oops, I had the wrong time on here. <laughs> if you click on stock selection webinar, I'll let that come up. Again, it's 14 hours total training, um, and you can get some more information on that. So check that out. Um, this is the cost. Again, this is the same cost as a year of my trading service. I'm going to give one year away free of that. I'm not going to do any fun, fun and games and say the webinar is 1400 and the trading service is 1400 and it's 2800 but wait, that, we're going to discount that by 50%. No, the price is what the price is. Okay, Maybe I need to be a better marketer to do all those things. I'm just not that good at it. Um, there is, if you do want to finance this through, uh, spread things out a little bit, you could do that uh, interest-free through, pay, uh, through PayPal. They have, um, what's it called? Bill me later on that, so if you're interested in that. Uh, if you want to sign up with a credit card, you could either use PayPal credit cards, or you could, you could call me directly, or you could fax me a, a credit card. All right, Scott wants to know about individual stock. All right, we'll get to that in one second. Any questions on... Um, Anything we covered so far, and then we'll uh, we'll take a look at a few stocks. That's fine with me. I don't mind. Some people don't like doing that. I I, I love doing that. A C H C. Okay, that looks pretty good. Uh, I could pick it apart a little bit though. Uh, first of all, it's a little bit on the thin side, so you might want to be careful with that. Okay. First, it's not bad. Okay. But if you look at it, notice that you've got this big pop here that came out, and then it just kind of meandered its way higher, and it really didn't accelerate higher on its trend. Usually, you want to see a stock accelerating higher, okay? So it looks okay. It's got an HV of 32, which is so-so. 
it really didn't clear that base decisively. I would pass on that, but again, it looks okay. Now, the other thing you need to look at with this stock here is it's already had a 400% move. Not that it can't keep going up, okay? And I, a little while ago, I said stock should thrust, pull back, thrust, pull back. And it has done that for the most part. But one has to wonder if this stock has run its course and might be a little bit more priced for perfection because it's pretty obvious now, whereas it might not have been obvious a long time ago. So I would pass on that one based on those reasons. It's not bad, but I think that you could probably find something a little bit better out there. Okay. Any questions on anything I covered? Any questions on the webinar? You're welcome, Scott. Okay. Got a quiet bunch tonight. I guess everybody's long day, huh? Okay, while we're in an impasse, obviously I want to thank you guys for coming tonight. I appreciate your time. Take a time out of your busy schedule to be here. Um, I'm humbled by your uh, fact that you would do that for me, so thank you so much on that. Uh, any follow-up questions, just uh, shoot me an email, david, davelander.com. I'll give everybody a – don't be shy. Uh, nobody can see what questions you're asking except for me. And there are no dumb questions when it comes to the markets, okay? Um, unless you want to ask me about a stock that's electrocardiogram. All right, uh, question on AVID, A-V-I-D. Okay. That ACHC, it's not horrible. I've seen a lot worse, okay? Yeah, that looks a little bit better than the other one, at least a shorter term. A uh, little bit on the thin side. It's only about 200,000 shares, but I think you're definitely on the right track because I don't know why it's doing that. If you, um, I must have something clicked. But if you look here, you can see that it was kind of in a gradual uptrend, and then it began to accelerate higher. So that actually looks pretty good. You got a bit of a knockout type of move in here. Um, I would use, I wouldn't look to get in until it took out this high. Now let's take a look at the longer term chart. And one thing that I do when I'm doing my scanning, and this is another thing we're going to talk about on Saturday, is that we do look at the short term trend, and then we look at the intermediate term trend, but you also want to back the chart way out to make sure there's no bad memories. Now you do have some bad memories way back here in 2010, but that's been a long time since then. So I wouldn't worry too much about that. It is a little wide and loose longer term, but personalities can change. So I like this stock. I think it looks pretty good. HV's a little bit on the low side, but I'm going to give it an okay. And I think that if you did get in, you want to get in above this high here, okay? Um, Remember, everything's for educational purposes only. This is not a direct recommendation, blah, blah, blah. But, yeah, it looks okay. Uh, another thing you might want to do is you might want to see what's going on within uh, computer multimedia graphic software. Now, another thing that we we'll talk about on Saturday, not to give everything away, but another thing we we'll talk about is you want to make sure, let's say you do like this stock, make sure you go to um, the the subsector here, this what is this subsector, multimedia and graphic software, and make sure there's not some sexy sisters or sexy brothers that you like just as much as the stock or even better. Because sometimes a mediocre looking setup in one sector can lead to an incredible looking setup in that same sector. So that's another little gem I want to throw out tonight and something that you want to do. You're welcome, Matt. Okay. Uh, yeah, and, uh, Andre, uh, I am going to record Saturday's session. And one thing that I've been talking, I'm talking with a few people on that. Um, I am limited, to, I'm, I'm going to limit the space to 20 people only. Um, and I think we're about halfway there now. I'm, I'm looking for it to fill up between now and then. Um, but I might open up a few slots 
for because there might be some people. Uh, in fact, there's already a couple of people that are overseas. There are a couple of people that are going to be aren't going to be uh, be able to make it. So yeah, I'm going to record it. Everybody who attends gets a recording. We'll get a digital download of the uh, webinar, and everyone who if for people who can't make it live, they will get those recordings. Um, the beauty of that is I'm going to be throwing out, I know I threw out quite a few things tonight, but I'm going to be talking for six hours on Saturday, um, nearly straight, and I've got a lot of information to cover. So I'm going to throw out a lot of things. I think it would be almost better if you could watch the recording, stop, absorb a little bit, maybe study some charts, and take it in in smaller doses because that's going to be a big dose all at once and then there's going to be the follow-up webinars so should you have any questions and by the way if you look on the website list of things I'm going to offer a limited lifetime support for anything we discuss in the webinar now don't don't call me a year from now and say hey Dave I need some help building a trading system uh, no that's not what we're covering we're covering how to trade stocks how to pick the best stocks that's what we're working on so if you if you call me a year from now and ask me a, a question about stock selection then I'll be more than happy to answer that. Okay, but yeah, the long story endless. Um, everything, yeah, the eight-hour ones too. Yeah, everything's going to be recorded, and that way, uh, those who can't make it live on Saturday, I don't expect everyone to be at every one of the eight-hour uh, the, the follow-up sessions. But I'm going to record those, and, and the beauty of that is going to be to see that methodology in action and to see those questions answered. In fact, if you do watch the recording, I'm going to have more time to answer those questions in those in those one hour sessions. It's going to be pretty intense on Saturday. Uh, I'm going to eat my Wheaties, I'm going to take my B vitamins. Um, I had a couple of clients ask me not to drink too much dew because I get a little too jacked up on the dew and these things, but it's going to be a long day. There's going to be a lot of information that's going to be put out on, uh, on Saturday. The follow-up webinars, though, I'm looking forward to those because I think it's going to be a little bit more relaxed in that we we're able to focus on some specific topics. We'll be able to focus on what stocks worked, what stocks didn't, what we could have maybe found in the past, and even in believe it or not, I'll even you know I, I miss I miss some really good stocks every now and then. But I go back and I study that success, and I ask myself honestly, could I have caught those stocks? And we're definitely going to do that in those follow-up sessions. Okay. So the answer is yes. It will be recorded. What's the smallest stock capitalization you consider? Uh, right around 200k is a is on the cusp of too small, and at that point you got fa you can factor in price a little bit, okay? So if it's a if it's a two dollar two hundred thousand dollar stock, that's pretty thin. If it's a twenty dollar two dollar stock, I'm sorry, if it's a twenty dollar two hundred share stock, then you could say, well, wait a minute, the capitalization or the trading of it is going to be a little bit bigger than that, that, that $2 stock. Okay, If you multiply the stock price by the volume, you get a, a certain capitalization number. Well, that capitalization number of a $2 stock should be much smaller than a $20 stock. But as a general rule, right around that $200K is, is really on the cusp of being too small. Uh, round numbers, let's say you got a 100K stock, you have a 100K stock. If you're trading a thousand shares of that stock, you are one percent of that daily float. You're almost big enough in and of yourself to kind of push the stock around, or certainly it's it's not liquid enough to get in. Okay, not that I won't ever kind of dip below that 200, but as a general statement, I like to be in more liquid stocks. Now, at some point in time, you know, and I might I might do this. In fact, um, I don't know. I've been. It's like it takes me a long time to do something. I've been thinking about doing this stock selection webinar for years okay it takes me forever to do something um, like this but at some point in time I think that the methodology does work very well with very thin stocks and as a private trader you could go in and trade those thinner stocks it's going to be incredibly dangerous and I think at some point in time I mean don't and this is my way of saying don't quote me on this because um, I, I'll never say don't trade it because it's too thin but at some point in time I think that I, I might do a service that dips a little bit below that 200K because there is some opportunity there, but there's also a lot of risk in doing so. Okay, so long with the answer, uh, if it's less than 200K, be extremely careful on that. Okay, smallest capitalization you would consider. 
Uh, I don't measure capitalization per se. I just look at the volume, 200K. You know, this stock here is kind of on the cusp of being a little bit too thin to trade. Um, I, I don't know if I would directly recommend trading this, but as a private trader, uh, you can get away with it, okay? Is Saturday's webinar going to be available as a recorded event with the package for us to look at? Um, yeah, well, right now what I'm doing is anyone who signs up for Saturday gets the recording. Uh, I haven't thought about what I'm going to do after the webinar on uh, how I'm going to sell those afterwards. I think I will eventually will sell those. Right now, I'm just focused on the live event, and those who uh, cannot, those who sign up this week and cannot attend it, will get a year of the service and will get the live event. Um, but I haven't decided exactly how I'm going to sell those afterwards. I, I'm not going to. Um, it'll be the same price they are now. I'm not sure if I'm going to give the entire year of the service uh, for the recorded uh, with the recorded ones. But uh, check with me personally on that. And uh, we'll work something out. If, you, if, you, if you're interested, but you're not interested, just right away. Okay. Uh, Jason wants to take a look at ABC. We can do that. ABC. Um, okay. This is a stock. Let's back the chart out a little bit. This is a stock that's probably priced for perfection because it's in a super duper longer term downtrend. Uh, the HV is very low on this stock. So you can look at it, it's like, wow, it looks like it's going to the moon. Well, it went from 65 to 70, and that took about six weeks. So, And then in more recent times, you can see, remember the net-net thing we talked about a few minutes ago? So let's measure this. So net-net, this stock has done much, if I could find my little deal, uh, in a month, okay, almost a month of sideways move, movement. So I would pass on that, even though at first glance, it looks like it is going straight up. And that's one of the things I'm going to cover. It's a pattern that looks like looks like this. You, you initially look at it, it looks like a pullback. But if you look carefully, you'll see that a stock may have gone a month or even longer uh, with no forward progress. So I would pass on that. Uh, HV is too low, okay? And HV is historical volatility. And it just hasn't made a whole lot of forward progress. And on top of that, again, it looks like it might be priced for perfection way up here. It's also a fairly sizable stock. This this boils down to the efficiency, inefficiency, because it is a larger cap stock. It's going to be more efficient in its moves. It took it uh, a month, or the whole month's time, it just kind of went sideways. So I would pass on that one. Uh, you know, let me interview myself. Is it trending? Yes. Is it a stock I would actually want to trade? No. I think you could probably find something at maybe uh, it, at, at a little bit lower levels, at least uh, something that hasn't made these uh, this massive longer-term move just yet. Maybe something a little bit more of a developing trend. Uh, what was the one we just looked at a minute ago? Okay, that's a good example of something that's in maybe a little bit more of a developing trend. See, it's coming off of low levels in here. It's not the perfect stock in the world because it is kind of wide and loose back here, okay? But personalities can change. If you zoom in a little bit on this, uh, this is ABID, by the way. If you zoom in a little bit, it looks pretty good over here. So maybe this stock could return to its old glory, whereas the ABC is going to be priced a little bit more for our perfection, okay? Okay, we're right about an hour. Um, yeah, email me on that, John. We'll talk about that. I'll, I'll, I'll be happy to work something out with you, however you want to look at that. That's fine. Okay, uh, any questions about the webinar? Any questions about stocks? Anything else? I can hang out for a few more minutes. Be happy to do that. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and wrap things up then. Um, thank you guys again for coming tonight. Again, I'm, I'm humbled that, by the fact that you actually uh, uh, came out tonight in spite of, you know, I know everybody's really busy this time of year. So, first of all, I, I really appreciate that. Um, hope to see you Saturday. Any questions, daviddavelander.com, and just shoot, call me if you want, 985-898-4993. Again, I answer my own stuff. You're welcome, Eric. You're welcome, Andre. You guys have a good night. Okay, Leon, I'll see you at the webinar. Thank you. Fantastic.